Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Institute of Export and International Trade about preparing exporters for the migration from the customs handling of import and export freight system, usually known as CHIEF, to its replacement, the Customs Declaration Service, which we tend to call CDS. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host today. And for those of you who are regulars on this program, you may have noticed that this is a similar topic to one we ran back in March. Well, there are two reasons for us running another webinar on CDS. Firstly, the timelines for when exporters need to be using CDS recently changed, which we'll be hearing about shortly. And secondly, despite the changes to this timeline, the importance of exporters getting ready to use CDS in place of Chief in the near future is paramount. And this webinar is part of a program which will give tips and advice to help exporters with this migration. On the next slide though, you'll see today's panel. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Adam Gregory from HMRC, who will be, be talking about the recent update to the CDS timeline for exporters. Adam is HMRC's readiness, cons and guidance lead for CDS. And after Adam, we'll then hear from a regular on the program in Matt Vick, who will be giving practical tips to help exporters with their preparations and Matt is a Customs and Trade Specialist at the Institute. After that, we'll, have a, we'll tackle a few of your questions in a dedicated Q&A. But on the next slide, before we get into the presentation, I'm just gonna run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. It's a pretty simple one, hopefully, uh, basically asking, have you already started using CDS to submit export declarations? The options being yes, no, and not sure. While you're answering that poll, just some quick housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window, which is usually to the right hand side of the screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. Please also note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. So please know war and peace today. Finally, you will receive a recording of the webinar along with a copy of the slides in a follow-up email which we will be sending over the next day or so. Now let's close the poll. Thank you everyone for answering and share the results. So a quarter of you have already started using CDS to submit export declarations, but the majority of you, 59% of you, have not. 16% of you are not sure. So thank you everyone for answering that poll. On the next slide, I think this provides an opportune moment for me to hand over to Adam Gregory from HMRC, who will give a quick update about the recent changes to the timings for when exporters need to be using CDS. Bye. So, Adam, over to you. Thank you and, and good afternoon and thank you for inviting me on. Um, as, as mentioned previously, I'm the readiness comms and guidance lead for CDS um, within, within HMRC. Um, one of the main aspects of that is going to be to help support and deliver products that will help support the migration. And seeing that 59% of you haven't started yet, um, hopefully our products and tools that will be delivered over the next few months will help support that at, at the right time and, and in the right manner. So thank you for your time. And, and recently, I mean, you probably would have noticed on the 23rd of August, HMRC um, announced a slip, um, a slip back of the date to the 30th of March 24 um, for the exports declar declarations deadline. That was moved from the 30th of November to the 30th of March. And, and that was mainly done in conjunction with some uh, key external partners and trade bodies who'd been reported challenges around being able to be ready, first of all, for CDS exports within the current timeline but also it must be said for HMRC to actually deliver the IT that's needed in the same timely manner that would allow me people to move across at the at the, at the right space and, and, and not being pressured into a short deadline um, as there had been the number of slippages over the year. So that was the kind of the main background for for the, the need to move the deadline and, and why the 30th of March we, we took that 
position where in conjunction with externals in terms of what was the most sensible date to move back to to give the trade the the, the appropriate time to move and, and 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 move across in the right manner but also um in support that actually there is a, a a element of dual running that's going on and um from an external point of view there is the necessity um, and the support there to move across to cds in that timely manner so um a 30th of march was was the desired outcome um and that, i suppose it in the announcement on the 23rd of August that you will have seen on gov.uk, we actually also announced a stage migration approach. Um, this was kind of a new approach that we came up with in terms of we know that there are a number of um, declarants out there that are actually able to currently move to CDS. And we didn't want to um, put in a barrier for those customers and declarants to move across um, as they prefer. And I noticed that, what, 25 percent of you have already started to do that. So what our stage approach will do is allow those customers who were in the journey and already wanting to move across and can move across. We're expecting them to move across and, and keep continuing that journey ahead of the potentially 30th of November and then once the next phase um, is based on IT being ready and mostly around inventory link movements will fall into the stage two so primarily groups in stage one currently include high volume declarants that make frontier declarations at a GVMS only location or a supplementary declaration um, so those are kind of the two categories that fall into stage one and HMRC are looking at the moment at those certain customers and we'll be contacting them do directly to help support their migration where possible. Um, with that, we, we know that we cannot support one to one engage, engagement with ed, every um, declarant that's out there. So we are doing targeted comms to those declarants, but also working with certain software providers to try to help facilitate those stage one movements. Um, so just to recap, the new date that we announced is the 30th of March with a two stage approach, um, stage one being GVMS only locations and supplementary declarations. And then stage two will be all other businesses and that will be migrated by the 30th of November. And when we say all other businesses, we know that that will um, mainly focus around those inventory link movements, which we do know makes the majority of, of the movements. Um, as I mentioned at the start, why did HMRC take the steps to the stage approach? We took the step of, of revising the approach so that IT could be thoroughly tested and the industry would be going to be given the, the, the needed time to test and, uh, and get declarants to be ready um, in a timely manner. We also know that the uh, period over Christmas and, and the early parts of, of January is a peak for um, some aspects of the of the trade industry. And we didn't want to um, isolate that area and target a, a mass migration over that period. So listening to external feedback was mainly the steer around the movement of, of the date. We also want to make sure that we have the re relevant and the correct support in place for when the different aspects of the stage come on. Um, feedback from industry bodies and delivery partners was that we need to make it as smooth a migration as possible and make sure that the internal support and the products that we produce are delivered in a timely manner as well. So the remove and the movement of the date will allow us to do that. Um, we also will be um, in the journey, we will be continuing to provide communications products guidance on gov.uk to help that move across. And I will touch on that slightly later in terms of what products we're going to produce. One of the questions is, is also at the moment, uh, what can you do at the moment and what would we be re recommending people to do? So we don't want customers all to wait to the end. We know that certain as aspects of customers will fall into stage two. But what we are also asking is if you need to still register and you can register, please do register um, and subscribe for CDS in advance. We also want to, uh, you to be contacting your software providers, um, uh, speaking to them to understand their um, software readiness journey for CDS. And also we want people to be accessing the um, trade address rehearsal that's free and is live. Um, we, we did find that numbers of issues in the imports that were actually found at trade address rehearsal, we were able to support um, the, the smooth journey in trade address rehearsal and that fed through into the live environment. So ideally we are pushing as many people as possible to use the trade address rehearsal service. And also finally, um, please keep a close eye on the CDS pages on gov.uk for the guidance that's gonna be um, in inputted and, and, and updated as we go through. This will include CDS toolkits, the key differences between Chief and CDS, 
and an introductory UK exports guide, guide that we will also publish on gov.uk. In addition to products to help support, we are planning to produce additional webinars, YouTube clips. We'll also be working with the Institute of Exports to deliver a webinar um, closer to the, the stage two migration to help support those inventory linked uh, movements and customers who need more information on what they need to do to support the migration. We're actually thinking that's going to be closer to the, the end of this year um, so that it's not done too early. Um, we also will be producing export examples so we know that these went down well in the imports so there's a number of exports examples that are being created um, that will be signed off very shortly and published on gov.uk so you can start to use them in trade address rehearsal to familiarize the the submitting of declarations exports declarations through the system um, we're targeting the the most popular ones first and then we'll be going down to some some more um, niche scenarios and we'll try and publish as many of them as possible as we go along um i will just pause there um and uh, i know that there'll be another poll but uh, just want to to ask uh, if everyone's comfortable as any poll questions around um any of that and the new phase approach to cds migration Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for that, for that update. Uh, there's a lot of information for people, but um, I have posted a couple of links in there. One to the uh, government announcement from August with the new timeline and also a link to the trade address rehearsal service so you can find out how to use that. But uh, yes, yeah, some, some really important uh, information there for everyone. I hope that's been useful. If the next poll, we are going to want a second poll. This one is asking, uh, so yeah. This one's asking, how do you currently submit declarations to HMRC? Uh, the options being self-file, so that's some, you submit it yourself. Maybe use an intermediary, maybe use a mixture of those two approaches. You might not even submit declarations at all, and there's a not sure option again there for you. Adam, more people are answering that poll. So we've had some decent questions coming through already, beginning with this one from Darren, who asks, and this question, I, I suspect a few people are thinking, is there a possibility of another delay? Is 30th of March 24 a hard deadline? Thank you very much. And, and that is a, it is a good question. And you, you're quite right. That is not the first time we've heard this. And and, and people will will know that HMRC, we, we moved the deadline for imports. And, and obviously, for, from the similar point of view, we've moved it for exports. What we can say is we are confident the new deadline will, will enable the right level of support to be in place for exports declarations. And also that relationship with the industry bodies and our delivery partners and suppliers to ensure smooth deadline by the 30th of March is kind of the, the stance we're taking. Um, I, I know that the, the, the question will be, well, actually, if people don't migrate across, will the deadline or will it just be inevitable that we'll move that across? HMRC's approach at the moment is more around that, actually, we are saying the last date of, of making exports declaration is the 30th of March. Um, after this date, all exports declarations still must must be on CDS by that point. And then I suppose the, the key the key point around um, the 30th of March is with moving that date because we've listened and we've we've heard the challenges that, that externals are having. And we, we've kind of come up with that in, in partnership with externals to make sure it is right. Um, there, there is a few dependencies on that and it has to be said that the IT needs to be delivered in a timely manner to enable that to hit but what we can say is in term internally in HMRC we are looking at a, an exceptions process um, we know we did one for imports and I, I suppose we, we've taken lots of feedback on our extensions and exemptions process that we did for imports uh, mainly in terms of improving that for exports and, and the steer is that it'll be more around exceptions um, so what we're not saying is we are keen not to move the date but what we want to do is look, work with those partners out there if, if they have not been able to move across by the deadline for a genuine reason HMRC will support that and also another reason why the 30th of March is set up and we know that uh, dual running is not a, a uh, something that externals are keen to continue with and we also know internally on CDS um, we have got um, challenges around the uh, chief deadline and we know that that is a position that we we need to and and we we cannot afford to to move away from that so that's another reason why we are keen to not move away from the 30th of march and that's why we've come up with that date as a a sensible uh, but also realistic date that we can hit 
Thanks, Adam. I'll, I'll keep the poll running for a little longer. Um, a couple of questions off the back of that. I mean, first of all, you've mentioned the externals and kind of how externals are really fed into this decision as well. So how can companies on the line feed into the, the further support, I suppose, or kind of the, the future timelines are going forward? So kind of what, what's the best way for companies or, you know, associations to, to feed into this process? Yeah, thank you. And and I suppose the difficult challenge that we've got is we can't we cannot get out and have one to one conversations with every declarant out there. But we want to make sure that HMRC, in terms of our engagement strategy or our comm strategy, but also our timelines, is realistic and we and we can um, meet uh, meet deadlines uh, but on both sides. So I think in terms of feeding that through, we do have a number of. Um, bodies that sit on certain HMRC boards and we do welcome feedback, i.e. Neg negative feedback, how can HMRC improve in terms of products that we think would work better and then we are very open, especially my team from a comms and engagement point of view, what products do we think uh, HMRC could deliver that would help to improve um, just the, the awareness around the CDS and help and support the migration. So we're happy to take those through either direct uh, from, from the Institute, but also when we do the webinars, if there is aspects in those webinars that, that we do when we get to the migration phase that can be fed through. I know the Institute of um, Export sits on a, a couple of uh, HMRC forums um, and in that, that is the route that we would be keen to take feedback, um, I suppose. Um, the one thing I would say is if we can combine that up into themes that we think uh, would be sensible rather than maybe individual elements of feedback that comes through. So, so yeah, um, uh, William, uh, we would be more than happy to take feedback um, on, on areas to improve products that we might want to deliver. Um, more than merrier, we would be happy to take those, those through if that helps. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, and yeah, as, as Adam notes, the Institute itself is on, the, on the various committees and uh, has those uh, lines of communication with, with HMRC on, on issues like this. So, um, yeah, we're more than happy to represent our members and the wider shadow community uh, with your feedback. But uh, we're going to have more questions towards the end. So I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. So, uh, 62% of you use an intermediary. I don't think that's too surprising. Uh, only 16% of you self-file, but a further 11% of you do a mix of both. So, you know, that could be 27% uh, of you self-file in some way or another. Just under a tenth of you don't submit declarations and 2% of you not sure. And at this point, I'd like to bring on Matt. Welcome to the webinar. Matt, great to have you with us again. Any thoughts on that poll? Is that about what you usually expect when dealing with businesses in, in the market? Yeah, I have to go and double check the numbers again, but if I'm not mistaken, I think the intermediaries is higher than the last time we did this one, um, which is an interesting trend in and of itself. But there's interesting correlation that we've got 25% of people that said they're already doing CDS exports, which translates to 16% self-file. I might have expected the self-file to be higher because of that. Um, but otherwise, no, I think this is broadly in line with what we've, well, what we've come to expect from these. So. Yeah, I think the, the intermediary one, I would be interested to check that. I, I do think it is higher. I am loading the response as we speak from March. In March, 55% yeah. of people use an intermediary yeah. and a quarter so far. So spot on. There you go. It could, it could always be the audience variance, of course, but yeah, it could also be a trend. So there you go. We love a trend on these webinars. But uh, on that note, I think it's time for me to pass the screen over to, to Matt to start going through some of the practical considerations exporters can be making now to start preparing for CDS. Over to you, Matt. Perfect. Thanks, Will, and thanks, Adam, for your piece as well. Um, so first of all, we're just going to run through just a, a little bit of context as well. Not much, but just to, to frame what we go th uh, forward with. Then we're going to go through as many little tips as we can to prepare you for the CDS exports in the time that we've got. There's obviously a vast amount of stuff that you know you can need to look at and it varies business to business because of your use case and your products, but we'll cover the basis that we can. So next slide, please. Here's a quick timeline just to kind of crystallize what Adam might have mentioned. Now, of course, most of us for our, our first experience with CDS really was halfway to end of last year as the imports deadline was looming. So that's given a lot of us a, a, a sort of barometer of what to expect this time. And again, there was a provisional extension on the 
import CDS declarations last year, which Adam just alluded to. Um, but as it stands, if I'm not mistaken, the stage one as it stands for CDS exports is the idea is by 30th of November, those high volume declarants get migrated to CDS exports for non-inventory declarations ahead of time. But of course, by the end of March next year, we will hopefully all being to plan have all switched over to the CDS exports. So next slide, please. Just to take any, a slight aside um, before we get into exports fully, there's a quick note here because there was a bit of a change to guidance uh, a couple months ago. So for those of you that also import, this is most relevant. Now, there is a data element 413 called valuation method. It did have an analog in chief as well. But just note that anybody that chooses to use valuation method one, you will need to prove or have evidence to hand that you are actually eligible to meet the conditions of it. Now, there is a link on the right hand side, which will hopefully be put in the chat shortly, which will tell you what the valuation methods um, conditions are. And you can read through that in the guidance without spending too much time on it here. But the short version is that if you're a freight forward or a customs agent, this is especially important for you because if a consignment value exceeds £20,000, you will need to have either a statement or some kind of evidence from the importer that you are, or that they are eligible to use that valuation method before you use it on the entry. So just a quick PSA, uh, just to help on that side of it. So next slide, please. Now, again, back to context. So why the CDS migration has happened? Well, I'll kind of do the most obvious one first, which is the end one, really. The CDS imports migrations already happened. Um, and as Adam mentioned, we are currently running the two systems. We've got CDS and we've got Chief. So the hope, of course, is to merge all into one system so it's consistent. But fundamentally, CDS itself came about because of a legislation change, a pretty big one. It was passed in 2013 and came into effect about 2016. So when we were still EU members, that was the Union Customs Code. And it pretty much overhauled to put it quite mildly, uh, how the custom system across all EU adopting countries worked. And that does mean a few um, little consistencies across the approach for all of those countries. So you will go into the guidance on TDS. Uh, you may have already seen this. Some lists will have what's called a union code, for instance, and some will have what's called a national code. Anything with the union code exists because of the UCC, and therefore anything on that list would be the same in the UK as it would an EU country that's also adopted it, uh, a prime example being the procedure codes, which we'll come on to in a bit. But the other big reason, of course, was chief. It was getting on. It's about 30 years old, which in software terms is quite venerable. So those are the broad strokes. There are a few more um, intricate reasons for it and some very much internal to the UK. Chief was already looked at being revised in late 2008 through to sort of about 2010. So it was sort of already on the cards, but this EU legislation really uh, pushed it over the edge. So next slide, please. So we're just gonna go through some key changes uh, and just for a bit of comfort food, we'll start with what's actually still the same. So next slide, please. And for those of you that are used to seeing any of this, uh, if, if you've got prior authorizations, prior badge codes, all of that will be the same. Now, there will be cases where, for instance, um, regarding authorizations, that actually how you enter and use those authorizations in CDS is slightly different, but the authorization itself uh, remains and you'll still be able to use it. Which port needs GVMS and which port needs inventory? That's unchanged by the switch. That's uh, slightly aside from CDS. So those will be more or less in line with what you're used to. Now, there are some slight intricacies with the exports, particularly regarding with GVMS. Um, with a general rule of thumb with a non-inventory export is that you have to submit the entry as arrived to begin with. Now, there are some GVMS ports where that's not the case and you do it as not arrived first. So that does vary by port. But again, that's not necessarily CDS. That's aside from it. Um, your URI, and if you already signed up to the CDS financial dashboard for imports, that's all the same. You don't need to do any of that again. You can continue with that. Um, all the status around things like representation. So if you're using, if you're a trader and you're using a customs agent, then all of that remains more or less the same. There should be some documentation between you, i.e. a standing letter of authority or power of attorney, whatever you want to call it. Um, just make sure it references Taxation Cross-Border Trade Act 2018, and that's the legal basis for that relationship between the two companies. And the last one is documentation. Um, this is broadly the same. There is a sneaky little asterisk there because as customs consultants, we always like the phrase, it depends. And it's very much the case here as well. So 
the broad strokes of what you need is a basic checklist for an entry remains. You need your invoice, be that commercial or pro forma, depending on the circumstances of the sale. Uh, you may need a packing list. Uh, you may need your transport document, like the bill of lading. If you're doing anything that requires an export license, of course, you're going to need that. But documentation, as it was before, is largely determined by factors outside of CDS, most likely your commodity code and or intended destination and things like that. So. All those kind of things will be quite familiar. There will be slight adjustments to make in terms of how it's actually entered into CDS, but you should be quite quite familiar for you. So next slide, please. I'll just run through, there was a pretty big change in terms of how CDS entries are started and actually created. Um, Chief didn't have these, they're called declaration categories. Um, if you're used to the procedure codes or CPCs in Chief, their general purpose was to say, what's the point of the entry? Why are you, in this case, exporting the goods? Declaration categories and CDS now kind of do that instead, but procedure codes also still do it. Um, but declaration categories are quite significant because they will determine what data elements, i.e. what information you actually need to enter into a CDS export declaration. So if you ever want to go onto the online guidance and you're just trying to shortlist, okay, what information do I actually need to put in? The best place to start is these, the declaration categories. Now, Anybody that was on a, a, the, the previous webinar we ran on this, I will do the same apology to anybody that's in Ireland. I cannot find a map that splits Northern Ireland from Ireland, and I didn't want to hand draw it at risk of offending anybody. So just bear with, Ireland is not part of the UK, I acknowledge this. Um, but there's a visual there, so your B1 declaration category is your standard export declaration or kind of permanent export, the, the one that most people will need. So that's the declaration category you'll need to look at the guidance for. The other ones we've got is B2, which is outward processing. So of course, if you are authorized or you're using what's called authorization by declaration, which is where you can use it three times a year without authorization, uh, you will need to do B2 to do an outward processing declaration. We've then got B4, which is exports to special fiscal territories or customs union, and that's represented by the green arrow on that map. It's things like the Channel Islands is, is usually what that comes to. And then we've got the C1 categories, and that's for simplified procedures. So if you are SCDP, authorized so EIDR and SDP your simplified declarations if you're authorized to use those you will need to use declaration category C1 in order to actually do the entry so a significant thing to remember as well is that you can only have one declaration category per entry so anybody that's already been doing imports or indeed that 25% of you that's already moved to exports that'll be familiar to you you will have realized this already of course but always make sure it's, it's to be pointed out uh, next slide please so as we mentioned on procedure codes, these are, in terms of how they are used and what they actually do, the function is very similar uh, to as it was in Chief. But some of the codes themselves, as in the numbers, um, can and will have changed. So what I would always recommend, especially if you're in the, in the process of migrating to CDS exports, double check the guidance to make sure that you still have the correct procedure codes. Um, one prominent one is cited in the example here. Again, the kind of standard permanent export CPC, so the one that's probably most commonly going to be used, is actually different in CDS. So in chief, you had one zero double zero double zero one, and that was your export CPC. Uh, in CDS, this is now one zero four zero triple zero. In most cases, there's a few assumptions to that. It's not a direct analog. All that means is that so the one zero means permanent export. The four zero means that the goods were previously in free circulation. Um, i.e. they were either manufactured or previously fully import clean into the UK. So just make sure that the circumstances are correct before you choose that code. Um, that's always the disclaimer there. So next slide, please. And the way I like to crystallize this really and, and, and to kind of make it make sense is think of it as a compatibility chain. So as it works, the declaration category is kind of king, hence the crown. Um, that's the thing that comes first, and the procedure codes, i.e. those numbers we just looked at, have to be compatible with the declaration category as well. So you might go through the process of choosing the declaration category, which is, you know, we had that list, there's only about half a dozen, you might select the right one. You then need to select your procedure code based on what you're actually doing with the goods, either permanent export, outward processing, etc. There are many more procedure codes. And following that is the additional procedure code. Now, in the previous slide, that was the trouble zero at the end. But what happens is the additional procedure code needs to be compatible with the requested procedure code, which is the technically the first four digits to cut a long story short. And those four digits need to be compatible with the category. So what can happen is you have a CPC in mind and not yet declaration category, and you can work your way back, but just make sure it all works. Otherwise, it will not actually go through successfully. So next slide, please. In terms of how you find what data is actually required, there's a lot of online guidance. Obviously, the main source is Trade Tariff Volume 3 for CDS. Now, 
anybody that used Chief, uh, this there was a trade tariff volume three, or there is a volume three for Chief as well. Just make sure you look at the CDS one, not the Chief one. Now, as we said, the main thing to look at is the quote unquote data set, and that's the declaration category effectively. It will shortlist every data element that you need to do that's mandatory or depends on other factors. So that's your first point of reference to kind of determine what you actually need to do for your export entry. After I've looked at the declaration category, I would probably recommend looking at the guidance on your particular procedure code. So on that previous example, 1040, that goes into a, um, I will say box, it's technically not a box, but that goes into data element 110. And you can look at the guidance of those procedure codes as the next thing I would generally see to make sure that you know what you need to put into subsequent fields in the entry. Following that, I would look at the additional procedure code notes, which is data element 111, aka those last three digits of the CPC. In this case, it was trouble zero. And I can tell you now that trouble zero generally doesn't require much to be actually added. And then the ones that often cause problems. So if I get called um, you know, to a site visit for a client, we often have issues around data elements 2.2 and 2.3. Now, data element 2.2 is additional information. And there's a few to this that you'll always need, one of them being RRS01 if it's a GVMS port, for instance. Um, if you're self-declaring your entries, you will need 00500 for imports. And that's generally stuff that you can find in the guidance, but you might need a bit of a hand to find. Um, data element 2.3 is additional documents. Now, these vary quite a bit and there's a lot of things that influence whether you'll need this field uh, a big one is commodity code and that can be if you've got certain documentation you need in order to, to export the goods you might need to declare it there the other one that it can be really is your procedure code so if you're doing a procedure code like for instance outward processing you may need additional documents to meet the criteria for outward processing and therefore you need to add those documents in data element two three so there's a bit of variance to that one it's always worth checking it um, there's a lot of options and sometimes you can need a bit of extra help on those. Uh, but next slide, please. And there's a big one to mention here, uh, a, a, a PSA, if you will, and anybody that was kind of there in the, in the initial stage of the import switchover will know this was a bit of an issue as well. But every time you do an export, especially if you're a manufacturer, you're the seller, um, you generally need proof of export. Now, under Chief, you generally got that in the form of the Single Administrative Document, or SAD. And that was the paper sheet you got that summarised the entry. It would usually say, you know, either Chief or SAD, C88 at the top. And that was the the, the way that Chief worked. Um, the paper form actually predated Chief, so the paper form came first. What Chief was doing was effectively filling out that form, but digitally. That's why you got it. And that was admissible evidence for proof of export. You could use it to zero rate your VAT. Uh, with CDS, though, there isn't actually a replacement for that form, not officially. Um, what's happened is most of the commercial software providers that you do your CDS entries through have created their own proprietary replacement for that document. It will look very similar to the SAD, um, but it's not technically an official uh, government document, document in the same way that C88 was. So for anybody that needs this quote unquote paper or just kind of summarize proof of export, um, what you can do is if, if you're using an intermediary, which obviously, you know, from the poll, the majority of you are, if you're not already and you do need it, just ask your freight forwarder or customs agent to provide that document for you. If you are self-filing and you haven't got it, um, it could be already part of your software package. You can just check the documents tab of your software or failing that, get in touch with the software provider to check on access to that system. Um, again, because there's cases where we're in a bit of a transitionary period. Um, especially with a recent act that just came out where a, a lot more documents is becoming digital and that is perfectly permissible. But there are particular cases where you, need, you still need paper evidence and this is how you'll get around that just in case it does come up for you. So just be aware again that they're proprietary replacements so they can differ a little bit from provider to provider. Uh, but next slide, please. So I mentioned there's a few data elements and there's a few little things within CDS exports that you can look at the guidance and there's a lot there on the guidance. There's a certain skill to navigating it. Um, if you need help with something like that, the IOE is there. We do have day courses which will help you with that particular kind of thing. Or we can have more targeted support. So for instance, full on consultancies and there can be one like I'm doing this week uh, where you go and visit a client and I will sit there and help you walk through, well, walk you through doing a CDS entry. So help is around and as we mentioned HMRC is going to be publishing more documents uh, and more guidance for you to utilize but if you do need that more targeted and access to expert knowledge then we do have it at the IOE as well so I guess the thing we want to get across is you're not alone and of course as you've seen on that timeline we're now several well 
well over a year and if you were dealing with Northern Ireland a couple years now experienced in CDS so there's a good wealth of, of troubleshooting that we can go through with you so with that next slide please and we'll hand back to another poll. Actually I wonder uh, Phil if you just move back to the last slide I just, I just kind of yeah. remark on um, that, that last bit there I mean um, thank you Matt as ever some really great practical insights but uh, if you haven't already done so do definitely look into the training consultancy offering from the Institute around CDS. Um, I've heard really good things from businesses who've already taken the consultancy and training that people like Matt provide so you know, there's, there's some really good um, testimonials uh, coming through so I really would recommend uh, looking at those services if you are kind of worried or confused about the process it's, it's definitely worth doing. But uh, let's do, as, as Matt alluded to in the next poll, we're going to do our final poll today. And it's, uh, it's an interesting one, asking how prepared do you feel today to start using CDS in place of Chief? Obviously, today is still a fair way away from 30th of March, but um, yeah, be really interested to see how you respond to this. And just while you're answering that poll, we'll start doing a few questions from, from the audience. I'll start with a couple from Matt, and then we'll bring Adam back in shortly. Uh, but we've had a question from where's it gone it was a question from jane who asked actually about imports and then i'll do a follow-up question on imports very briefly jane asks when will hmrc finally close down chief for imports has it already been closed down that is that right uh it, th there are some contingencies where people can still use it in some cases but i think the line i should take on that and adam can tell me off if otherwise um the line i will take is that generally speaking no one unless specifically authorized should be on chief now chief i i don't know if there's potentially confusion as well but of course chief is still running for exports and that will be as we say shut down later next year um but no otherwise for imports consider it unless you're specifically authorized consider it gone uh, that is correct and uh, just on that point um there is there is a bit of work going on because there is a number of, of uh, declarants out there who still do have um extensions um for, for certain reasons and they're still using imports um there are also customers who are potentially still using um cheaper imports and they have not got extensions um hmrc will be writing an email in out next week to say what well, the chief permissions potentially will be removed um and that will hopefully prompt that position but yeah you, you're quite right uh, the 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 imports for chief was was way back this year earlier this year so so yeah that definitely is the correct answer <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, so it's a green tick for, for Matt. And just one more question on imports, uh, just referring back to the valuation piece. Uh, so this comes from Sophie. Uh, could you explain the change to valuation method one for import declarations again, please? Yeah, I'll, and I'll do it as it's a very complicated topic, to be fair. But um, valuation methods, just for those that are unsure, is when you do a customs entry, you basically say, how did you arrive at the value you've declared? So if you've declared for instance, a £10,000 commercial value, you're basically saying, what's the evidence for that? Now, generally speaking, valuation method one means there's a direct sale. So, i.e., you've just, if you're importing, you've just bought those goods from a supplier in, say, China, and you have a commercial invoice to evidence that, and the price is at, you know, broadening market rate. Um, the change and the reason why the change has come about is due to some issues with some not quite understanding what valuation method one is. Um, there is guidance in the link that was provided that will show you what the terms for actually using it are and when you cannot use it so there is a prime example for instance you cannot use valuation method one if you are not the direct importer so if you've um cds allows you to declare importers exporters buyers and sellers separately you can have situations where you're you bought the goods from let's say a uk wholesaler they are the actual importer of record they've sold the goods on to you uh, and then the supplier from the origin country has shipped it to you sort of indirectly in those situations you're not actually allowed to use valuation method one because you as the final destination were not the importer of record so that's one case like for example where you're not actually eligible to use it and the reason this statement is in place is because hmrc basically just want to make sure that you're aware of what the terms are and they want you to confirm that you've checked the criteria and that there's no misdeclaration going on so this was kind of always the case that you should know what you're doing when you declare valuation methods but it's just a bit of a tightening up and an extra verification step great stuff thank you thank you matt and uh, we'll, we'll pause on imports for now this is an export webinar so yeah we'll, we'll try to keep the focus for the rest of the q a i just want to share the results to the poll thank you everyone once again for answering uh, so 52% of you quite prepared, 9% of you very prepared. So a decent majority there are feeling broadly positive. 
uh, just over a quarter of you not very prepared, 4% of you not at all prepared, so 30% of you kind of uh, less positive, 8% uh, of you not sure. Now, Matt, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you remember roughly where that was at last time we did this webinar? Uh, if you're going to ask me to put a number on it, no, I'm not going to remember that much. Um, but I do think the um, quite prepared was significantly lower. I think very prepared is very similar. Um, it's kind of a, a subset of companies that always keep on top of it and are ready to go. But I think quite prepared was lower um, and not very prepared was higher. So there is a shift towards the other way. Um, for those that are not very prepared, I would encourage you to ask questions and you know if anything through that's really making you unsure especially if you've already done imports but yeah i again without putting a i, I wouldn't i wouldn't bet my mortgage on it but i, I do think the quite prepared is higher this time absolutely spot on it's, it's remarkable yeah. your recall so yeah last time it was uh 10 percent very prepared and um, so it's a slight very slight drop there but 37.5 percent were quite prepared last time so it's a good yeah. it's a good movement there um and yeah, yeah it was about 40 percent weren't feeling as prepared so that's, a, that's definitely a positive trend there. Um, I'm glad to see that. And just while we got the poll results up, Adam, uh, we, we did have a few questions in um, just about kind of how HMRC is going to be supporting uh, businesses with the migration. Um, so there's one from Sue who was asking, how will you support export direct declarations to move to CDS? And then another question from Lydia who asked, how will HMRC be communicating thoughts about the transition to businesses? Yeah, thank you, and and, and it's a, it's a good point, and uh, I suppose we are we are doing this the second time round. So we've got a, a experience of what went well and what didn't go well from imports, and that feedback's fed into our strategies for this time. So a number of things, communication strategy will be comes um, directly about the guidance, the the examples, the webinars, and the YouTube products that we'll be publishing over the next three months. They will all be uh, as part of our comms drive. Um, we will also be doing um, engagement webinars, either directly driven by HMRC, or we will be doing them through the likes of Institute of Exports in terms of supporting directly what you need to do and when. Um, what I must say is um, this is all driven by the, the readiness of the, the IT systems within HMRC and within our CSPs. So we don't want to go out early and we don't want to do something too far in advance and, and then everybody forgets about it. So do be mindful that our communications will go out to say what you can do and when. And as we progress late to later on this year, we will we'll get to a position where we'll be saying, actually, now we know our IT is ready. We will be doing more um, direct activity and that will be focused around those webinars, those YouTube clips and the activity through the Institute of Exports to directly say, right, we know the systems are ready. We know where everything's in place and here are the products that are put in place to help you get ready. So I, I, what I will say is please do register um, with HMRC and CDS because um, the emails get pinged out to those email addresses. So please do make sure that you you are all registered so that you can get those emails um, in a timely manner. And, and again, I just touched on the point earlier on around feedback mechanisms through the Institute and any products that you think would be supportive and best use, please do flag them because we, we are open to ideas and suggestions. Terrific. Thank, thank you, Adam. And I'll, I'll post the link very shortly to the uh, where you can register uh, for updates about CDS. On the next slide, you'll see that we are very much already in the Q&A uh, anyway. Uh, so we've got a good few minutes of questions here. Uh, a question we had, in, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce this correctly, but from Spirit Dula, who says, what other challenges arising for the deadline? And I guess this could be taken in two ways. It could be arising you know, for the implementation of the deadline or arising from the deadline changing, I suppose. So I guess that's more of a question for Adam. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And and I suppose it, it's probably twofold, actually. The 30th of November deadline was, was a twofold. Uh, internally, HMRC knew that there was a number of IT uh, products that needed to be landed for exports to be ready. They were not delivered on time. And that was mainly around the support um, and getting the CSPs um, to be ready as, as needed and, and also give CSPs enough time to deliver their product so that software houses could develop their products to align. So it was kind of everything's driven around the IT. So the 30th of November was massively around that. 
and the feedback from our externals around readiness of certain sectors of the market. What I can say as well, it's kind of it's twofold because it flows through to the, the new deadline. We still have IT products that we are currently delivering over the next two phases, and that also links to CSPs delivering aspects of their readiness. So um, the risk to that deadline and the risk to the challenges of that is, is all based around IT products being ready and then sub subsequently given enough time for declaration to be ready to move across so that really is where we are supporting and, and kind of trying to manage that risk and get those IT uh, products landed and in a, in a timely manner thank you thank you Adam and uh, Spiridil has already typed and say thank you uh, for the answer as well so great stuff all round uh, a question from uh, for, from Matt this one comes from Terry Will we be able to amend export declarations when CDS is introduced? We had issues with this uh, for import declarations last year. Yeah, amending amending is a bit of a difficult one to cover. So the short, <laughs> the long answer is yes and no. The short answer is no. Um, for those that submit an entry, there's a roughly 10 minute dwell time uh, before it actually kind of goes from your system to CDS. In that 10 minute dwell time you can make amendments to some fields you cannot as, as if your entry status flips through for instance clear after that point the current situation is you pretty much cannot and i know this is an issue for some people particularly if you're doing things like exports out of customs warehouse you'll have instances where you perhaps don't know for instance the container number of what it'll actually be when it leaves the country because that happens perhaps even a couple of weeks after it's collected from your warehouse what cds says you can do in the meantime is put container number unknown but what it then does expect you to do in the guidance is amend that to say um well to add in the container number later but of course there are issues around the amendments so unfortunately there's a bit of a that that's largely going to affect inventory more than it will non-inventory but there is currently an issue around amendments still just as the world with imports unfortunately i don't have a more positive answer for you on that front Thank you anyway, Matt. I uh, hope that was useful. Uh, <laughs> hope that was useful. But uh, yeah, it's, these questions can be tricky. So um, there we go. Uh, a few questions around procedures now. So we've had a question from Katrina. Uh, can we have, for example, standard and output processing goods from the same export declaration in CDS? Uh, Matt, uh, that wrong? Yeah, that one's, that one's easy. That one's a no. Um, you might remember uh, a few slides back we referred to the declaration categories and as we mentioned you can only have one declaration category per entry and with the permanent export declaration category and outward processing declaration category being separate that is mutually exclusive and it prevents you from doing both on one entry um, as it is I mean, technically you could do it on chief i mean again it's one of those that you kind of shouldn't have done it on chief but you could on a technical level um, so this is one that if you were combining outward and standard goods uh, into one entry, you will need them. You will need to split them into two declarations now. And if you're doing inventory linked export declarations when that goes live, um, the same thing you had to do with Chief in combining the DCRs will happen again, where you take the two DCRs and put it under an MCR. Those who know what that means will know what that means. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a lot of uh, acronyms, but yeah, if you were doing that workaround before, it, it will work again. Interesting. And uh, another question on from on procedures, once it's on, on transit, it comes from Craig. Will the change to CDS uh, exports affect how we do transit movements? Uh, another one there? Not, not really. Um, there is a change to transit movements coming up, but it's not because of CDS. So uh, NCTS, the new computerized transit system, which was new about 25 years ago, but anyway, um, that is being updated to NCTS 5 uh, in November this year. So that will come with it some changes for instance the TAD the document you normally need to accompany the goods uh, presently it needs to be physical it needs to be an actual document uh, the big change in NCTS 5 will be that that can be digital now um, there will also be some slight changes to the transit declaration process but in terms of CDS and CDS exports that will largely not change like for instance your um, custom supervised export authorization will remain the same as well so not change so if you were using that you've got no significant changes from CDS to worry about Terrific. And we are, we are hoping to do a webinar on NCTS 5 mm -hmm. uh, next month. So keep your eyes open for that one. Uh, we've had a question come in from Emma. I think this one goes for Adam potentially. Uh, so will customs agents or brokers be considered high volume declarants and therefore be selected for the first phase 
or will this decision be based on the number of declarations made by the company on whose behalf the export declarations are made? Very good question, and and yeah, it's it's based on the numbers of de uh, sorry the number of declarations made by um, certain declarants. So um, we've we've done some analysis working with trade stats, and we've come up with um, 148 declarants who sit in the category of above 10,000 declarations a year, and those are the ones that we are classing as um, high volume declarants, and those are the ones who were supporting in the first phase of of migration. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was a, a good answer. Uh, so we've got about five more minutes for questions, so we'll keep on rattling through these. A uh, question from Chris. Uh, if I'm using NES at the moment, I think that's the National Export System, can I continue to submit export declarations using the Chief platform, and how will this convert into a CDS usable format? Uh, is that one for you, Matt? Yeah. I can definitely. actually come in as well if you want, Matt. I don't mind. Shall I go first and you can correct anything? You go first. <laughs> no, no, you go first. Um, NES is basically intrinsically related to Chief. So with Chief being phased out, NES will go with it. Um, anything that's so CDS exports is just CDS exports. It's kind of a more holistic thing. Um, the, the latter part of the question in terms of how do you do the transition? Well, there it's going to be all within the CDS exports platform, more or less. So you won't have to worry about that as such. That's part of the migration. So that's as kind of straightforward as I think I can make it. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to say as well, if if you want the the Nes Nes web system that that's currently live um, for Chief, like like you said, Matt, it is also being replaced. Um, C CDS um, is also delivering a similar service that will be a a HMRC free to air service. Um, now I would say uh, the name of it, but it's added a very long name. So it, I think it's CDS uh, Dig Digital UI, but we might come up with a more snappy name. It's currently going through a, a number of phases of, of private beta um, and potentially public beta later on this year. So we will be going live with that as well and, and we'll come out with more communications. What we'll do with that one is it will be direct communications to those uh, customers who currently use the NES, NES service. Um, so keep your eye out for that for those customers as well. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, a really good question from Kate. Uh, it actually refers to the Electronic Trade Documents Act, an important piece of legislation which uh, came into force last week, which basically gives digital uh, versions of certain trade documents the same legal footing as paper documents, and Matt alluded to it earlier. Kate asks, will, the new, will this new law, um, or with the new law, what would be the best practice for entering e-document in information into CDS? Uh, there's so technically speaking you you could sort of do this already so if you were doing things like um seaway bills you could take the pdf whatever it might be uh, copy and you can save it against the entry um the thing to bear in mind on the Ele electronic trade documents act i keep still wanting to say bill um that's going to focus mostly on the document sort of ancillary to customs so it's mostly the as the name suggests the trade documents so it is the transport stuff and the other documentation around that um cds so anybody that's ever had an entry go, what would have been Route 1 or Route 2 in Chief, where it has to be, you need to provide documents to um, NCH and the National Clearance Hub, that kind of documentation will still be very similar. And you can do that more or less digitally in most cases anyway. So for instance, if you get your consignment pulled and they ask to see the commercial invoice, you could always just send a copy of the invoice. Um, likewise, if they needed something like a for um, SPS products on imports, IPAFs, et cetera. Um, that at the moment, I think, is one of the ones that's targeted to switch to a more digital thing, but that's also part of the border target operating model. So there's, when we talk about CDS and, and the documents you need for customs, that's a bit more of a focus remit, and it's still very similar, even with, um, partly because we'd already made some strides, but even with the Electronic Trade Documents Act, um, it's not going to be a huge difference to the process of clearing the goods at the border. It will just help you in terms of the other documentation that you need. Um, the other caveat I would add to that is that, of course, digital documents is kind of two ways. You can only have digital doc documents if the supplier or your end customer in whatever country you're exporting to will accept them. So just bear that in mind as well. You might still need physicals if the commercial um, arrangement calls for it. So Vic, thank you. Uh, really interesting time for, for trade, isn't it, with uh, all the digitalization aspects. Uh, we're getting some really good questions, everyone. Um, so one from Alexandra 
are there any capabilities within CDF to prevent unauthorized parties declaring another party as a registered exporter and making the declaration in the name without their knowledge or instructions? Bit a big question, Matt. Yeah, um, there's safeguards in that there's more data elements you have to fill out this time in order for that to work. So same same for a lot of authorizations. Um, for instance, if you were to, yeah, if you if you use that, or if you were to use or try and use someone's uh, customs warehousing authorization, for instance, um, there's a data element where you need to enter the customs warehousing authorization number, which is quite long in of itself. Um, there's another data element, 339, where you need to enter the year and number of the person who holds the authorization, and you might have to put the details of the guarantee that relates to that authorization as well, which can be much harder to come across if it's it's not like um, just entering the URI number and the authorization number will work. Basically, there's there's other ones behind it. CDS, the, the thing to bear in mind um, is fairly intelligent on things like data validation, but CDS will most often check that a field is completed and to the correct format. It doesn't necessarily know if the URI number or you know whatever is being entered isn't belonging to the um, person doing the declaration if they've as good as declared that they are that company, if that makes sense. So CDS will check that the URI numbers match from party to party, but if that URI number is incorrect in the first place and it belongs to another company, you can't necessarily stop that. Um, again, the amount of information it needs makes it very difficult for someone to use it without full knowledge and full authorization anyway. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about SADs. Um, so Mark says, I'm confused. Will SADs still be available after the transition as I need these for my controlled product exports in accordance with the licenses we use? Um, and yes. uh, Spiro Dealer also asked a question about SADs as well. It yeah, was a similar thing. Um, yeah, this goes, this goes back to that proof of export thing. So the SAD is related to Chief. It's the single administrative document, as I mentioned um, on the slide earlier. Most, so, of course, something to bear in mind, if, if you're not someone that submits entries yourself, um, may not know this, but nobody directly interfaces with CDS. Basically, you do it through third party softwares, which allow you to submit CDS declarations. What's happened is that Chief does not have a direct replacement for the C88 or SAD. Uh, sorry, CDS does not have a replacement for Chief's CAD, SAD. Um, but the software providers that allow you to access CDS have all had an officially kind of signed off replacement for it. So. The short answer to your question is there is an SAD equivalent that you should be able to use and is recognized by HMRC by agreement with the AFSS, the Association of Freight Software Suppliers, I think it is. So it is a it's under a sort of memorandum of understanding. So it will be legitimate and you can use that document that comes from the software. It's just not actually an SAD. But if you go to your freight forwarder and say, can you send me an SAD? Chances are they will know what you mean. Um, so in terms of process of getting it from your agent, that will be similar. Just be aware that it will look a little bit different. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I hope that's helpful. Uh, the question is there, and we'll do a quick fire double for Adam to finish off with. Uh, the first one comes from Michael. Uh, when will HMRC provide guidance or start to allow inventory linked port declarations? And the second question from Lisa is CDS available already for exports or do we have to wait until it's ready? Well, both good questions. Um, so firstly, CDS is, is ready for exports declarations at the moment, but only for those um, via GVMS routes. So that's kind of the, the, the stage one. So what I will say is just wait for direct contact from HMRC or your software provider before um, embarking on making declarations. And that's mainly because the inventory link, which answers the second part of the question, inventory link movements uh, on CDS are currently not ready for, for exports. And, and to answer the question, we are delivering IT um, aspects for the CSPs over the next two months leading up to November. And the expectation is um, those two releases will be the ones that will deliver the, the key IT aspects that need to be delivered. And from that, we will then be able to say that inventory link movements can be made on CDS. And that basically means all customers can move across. So what we'll be doing at that point is communicating, um, you can come across, but what we will be doing in advance of that, so um, through the remainder of this year and the early parts of winter, so we can say November, December, that is when CDS um, guidance will be published, examples will be published, test examples that you can use on the TDR will all be going live. And then once the we've had confirmation and testing's gone through for CDS inventory linked, we will then say um, it's live and ready and all, all declaration types can move across. Um, but it will be later on this year. And, and please just keep your eye on that and, and keep your eye out for the email 
emails from us um, and use our TDR service just to to prepare and ready yourself. Hope that answers both of those, Will. Thank you very much, Adam. And I have post links to where you can subscribe to the CDS updates and also to the trade address rehearsal in the chat as well. So on that note, I mean, we can never get through all of the questions in these webinars. We've had, you know, a couple hundred of you on the call uh, throughout. So it's apologies we couldn't get to everything, but uh, we are going to be doing more of these webinars. Uh, and we did a Q&A for the exports one, a completely just Q&A dedicated webinar. So we might do a similar thing um, uh, in the lead up to the export deadline. Um, so thank you uh, once again to Matt and Adam for answering all those questions there. And I, I hope everyone has found the, the webinar useful today. Uh, just onto the closing slide now. So a reminder that we will be sending the recording of today's webinar with a copy of the slides in the follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please do get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. Our next webinar is going to be a key update on a topic we've again covered a few times this year already, but this time it's the border target operating model. It's the first time we've done a webinar on the model since the official version of it was published in August. And that version includes various new timelines that importers need to be aware of. Uh, this webinar will be of particular importance to businesses importing food or agricultural goods subject to sanitary or phytosanitary checks, but it's of, of importance to traders in general, I'd say. It's taking place on Wednesday next week, the 4th of October, and will feature a couple of uh, other IOE webinar, webinar regulars like Kevin Shakespeare will be on that one. Uh, you can go to export.org.uk for more information about our upcoming webinars and activities, including how to join as a member of the Institute and the educational and consulting services we provide to businesses and individuals looking to thrive in international trade. But thank you once again, everyone, for joining us today, for Matt and Adam for presenting. And as you leave, please do let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any suggestions for topics in future events by completing the short exit survey. But for now, bye bye. <laughs>